Welcome back to Two Homers and a Realist. We have an exciting show for us today, and I'm going to start out just making brief introductions. I'm Steve. Lucas. Jay. Connor. And special guest, Casey Gundy, son of Kale, um, Oklahoma Lure, a um, lot of history with the program. He's got a lot of interesting insights to share with us. We were talking over dinner, got a lot of inside information that he's going to share with all of us. He knows exactly what the OU uh, depth chart's going to look like coming into the season, as well as what the record's going to be. He's going to share those predictions. But he, no. wrote, he wrote the script. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> he wrote, he wrote the script. The script. Yeah. Casey, welcome to the show. Thank you. Yeah, well, yeah, glad man. to be here. Thanks for coming Thanks on. For coming. So tell us a little about yourself. You, you were with the program as a student assistant and a graduate assistant for the years 2014 through 2019. Yes, sir. Um, tell us a little bit about what that was like and, and what your experience was. Yeah, so um, 2014, when I decided to go to school to OU, um, that spring, my dad started talking to me about helping out. Um, so that summer, I started learning Heupel's offense, learning signals and formations and plays. Um, so we, we have routes seven on seven in the summer, so that's kind of where I started learning. Um, so I was in my dad's room from 14 to 16. So 2014, it was a running back room. 15 and 16 was inside receiver room. 17, I went and sat in Lincoln's quarterback room. Um, it's a good room. It's a good room. <laughs> yeah, it was okay. Good Who was in that room? Okay. Just tell us a few of the names. Uh, we may not know, recognize 2017 would have been Baker, Baker Kyler. Okay. Mayfield. Baker Mayfield. Mayfield. Baker yeah. Mayfield. Yeah. Kyler right, Murray. No. Uh, God, who else was there? Austin Kendall. Uh-huh. Mm. Um, I think we only had three scholarship so quarterbacks at the time. Yeah, that year. Yeah, that would have been only three scholarship quarterbacks. A couple of good ones in there. Yeah. Actually, three guys that started at respective schools yeah. and two of them that went on to some really good First things. First-round picks, Heisman's, yeah, 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 yeah. NFL. Pretty yeah. good. Um, and then so... How, well, how responsible for that were you? Like 99%? Or? Probably more like responsible like outside of football. Just making a good friend sometimes. Did you keep an eye on Baker in situations? <laughs> or him looking out for me. Oh, okay. I mean, kind of 50-50 there. <laughs> And so then, uh, obviously, we're there in the 19th season with Hertz, mm -hmm. and so that's pretty Safe. exciting. So, um, thinking back, what was the most memorable games, both the good and the bad? Which ones stand out to you? Probably the most memorable, go back to 2015. Um, you know, we came off a rough 2014, at least rough for OU. You know, eight and five is good for a lot of programs, but not for A lot for of OU. question marks going into that 15 yeah. season, right? Yeah, you know, we got a new offense coordinator, new offense. Um, you know, inevitably Baker is going to be the quarterback. Um, you know, I think it was the third game of the season we go to Tennessee, second or third. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Um, you know, we go down there. Good. It's a really good Tennessee team. It's sold out. It's 110,000 people. Um, they were pumped for that they game. They were top 25. It's, I think yes. they were like 21 or yeah. something. Yeah, right they were talking Tennessee's comeback year, and yeah. the, the OU game was going to be the one what that sent them name? on their Butch, way. Butch, uh, Butch Jones. Butch Jones. Jones. Yeah. yeah, it's, you know, it's all orange. It's loud. You can't hear anything. Um, Literally. That third down for what was oh, yeah. amazing. The place John, is rocking. It's loud. Um, they piped in music. They were crowd noise in that game. You know, we were down till halftime. I was it 21 3, 21 7, some, yeah. somewhere? We were down there. all the way we were through not the third. Playing well. we, all no, the way we had a the, really bad first into half. Into the yeah. fourth, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, second half, we start making some plays, moving the ball, scoring. Um, honestly, I think the play that sticks out to me the most in my entire career was uh, was Shep's touchdown there in the corner of the end zone. Yeah. Um, you yeah, know, late the in the game. ballerina move. It's uh, the place is loud, you know, on the sideline that we can't even see over there, so. We don't know what's going on. Um, it's on a third down, too, I think. I believe it's a third or fourth down. Yeah, maybe it's third or fourth. Yeah. I can't remember. Yeah. Um, you know, Sheb catch, catches a fade in the end zone. The whole place goes silent. We don't really know what's going on. You find out it's a <laughs> touchdown. You know, place goes crazy. I'd say that's probably the most memorable moment, like a single play that I could come up with. Um, games, it would be that game or 2015 Baylor, probably. Okay. Um, I'd probably stick with the 2015 season just because, you know, it's kind of a, in a sense, a comeback year. I mean, Definitely. not necessarily a comeback. I mean, we went eight and five, which, like I said, it's, it's a turning point. But you it, was, it, was a, it was a revival. It's good yeah. for a lot yeah. of programs, but it's not what we expect at Oklahoma. You know, yep. we, the year before we went to Sugar Bowl against Alabama, you know, 2013 was a great season for us. Um, so I think 2015, you know, it was just a lot of fun. We uh, had a great season, kind of set the standard and, you know, turn things around to a better Was direction. that environment um, 
uh, as intimidating, more intimidating than the Ohio State environment, would you say? I think so. Yeah. Um, you know, the Ohio okay. State team in 17, I, I, it's a better team, obviously. You right. know, a lot more better players, NFL players. Uh, but OU was better as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, we had an entire NFL team on offense. You know, had some guys on defense. Um, I just think that place was so loud. Mm-hmm. Um, the checkerboard stands really stands yeah, out to me. It's, it's an, everybody it's a really, dressed the, It's a the special part. environment. I mean, yeah. there's not a lot of places like that. Yeah. Um, Knoxville special. I've gotten to go to a game at, at Jordan Hare. Um, I think, honestly, probably the coolest football game I've ever been to is a kick six game at Auburn. Mm. Um, I was in the student section that game. Oh, wow. Um, that's probably the coolest game I've ever been to, but that's, I mean, you know, Iron Bowl. That's something a lot of OU fans will become um, more uh, knowledgeable on once they get in the SEC and you're playing those games. Mm-hmm. That's um, a historic game as well. I mean, yeah. That, that game was – Everyone that lives in that. that lives in yeah. lore. Right? Yeah. Well, and I think a lot of people, you know, like – tailgating you know they've changed tailgating around campus and stuff but you know obviously the stadium sold out but i mean how many fans do you think are outside the stadium during games yeah. right i mean today maybe yeah. twenty thousand. Twenty. i mean there's, to there's a hundred there's a hundred outside those stadiums you know exactly. um so i think tennessee um definitely tennessee over the ohio state you know ohio state was better but i mean we were a lot better um i think the cotton bowl is really cool um, yeah, tell Yeah, what's it like running that? out of the tunnel? You know, none of us here will ever experience I, it. I, did, I don't run out of the tunnel. I'd go out before. Mm. I'm still working my way there. Yeah, I, can, <laughs> I don't well, like how he's got no yeah, hope here. Exactly. Right? You know, I mean, I'm an end zone analyst, so I, I mean, I'll just sit above the tunnel. I'm still trying to be maybe the first 43 year old walk on. So, <laughs> it's oh. like, hey, anything's possible. Oh. Um, <laughs> you know, a stadium that's truly split 50 50 down the middle, um, two passionate, you know, very historic fan bases, you know. OU and Texas are two historically top five programs, in my opinion. Um, I know Texas hasn't been there the last, you know, 10 years or so, but Texas, in my opinion, should be a top five, top six team every year. Um, and, I mean, no matter what, I mean, we've been undefeated in those games, and they've been two and three, and they've been a terrible team, and it's still the environment. It's insane. I mean. Yeah, you're almost more scared going into that type of game. Yeah, because you're going to get their best shot. Yeah, they got nothing to lose. And yeah. that's part of being Oklahoma is you're going to get everybody's best shot every week. And, I mean, I think you guys see that. I mean, you know, uh, teams like Iowa State and Kansas, who are historically not very good, they've gotten better in the teens and, you know, these early 2020s. and. That's a legit team that you play every week now. I mean, you can lose to them every week. Yep. Um, we almost lost to Kansas when we were in Lawrence. Yeah. Yeah. And Caleb Williams yeah, had two to years take ago. the ball away from Kennedy Brooks yeah. for that first down. I mean, and, you know, Iowa State's always a solid team year in, year out. Kansas has become a lot better program. I mean, I think when you guys go up there this year, it's going to probably be a sold-out stadium. Yep. I mean, they Which started selling crazy. games at the end of the stadium <laughs> or the end of the last season. Um, Leopold, he seems like a pretty good coach. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, it I'd seems like that. someone who's invested in it as well. He, it's not like it's a, like Les Miles just that's not taking a, a job there. Yeah, yeah. he's, he's yeah. not using not it as some sort job. of launch point yeah. or something. Yeah, like and that, I, I think so. I want to say he said something about like I'm here to stay. You know, a lot of guys would have had that year and be gone. You know, yeah. I feel like Kleiman could be like that too. Yeah, I mean, I, he I could think, be a K State lifer. Who knows? I think Kleiman kind of fits the Kansas State archetype, and you know, they Kleiman got a good fits thing going perfectly there. at Kansas State. For sure. I agree with that. Which would worry yeah. me if we were still sitting yes, in the Big 12. Yeah. That's one guy we've talked about having problems with. It's yeah. Climbing so, like, hard nose that well, and, you know, his teams reflect that. With, you know, sports have changed. There's so many better players and better athletes now. And if you think back to, like, the 2000s, I mean, every kid went to OU, Texas, what, USC, Ohio State, LSU, Florida, yeah. Miami. Michigan, you know, there's yeah. – probably eight teams, 10, 10 to 12 schools. Yeah. Everybody gets players now, right? You know, Kansas, they get four-star recruits now. Everybody gets good players. There's, you know, player development and the high school kids are better. Yeah, the player so, archetype is completely uh, Pittsburgh changed. Pittsburgh had a sure. Blitnikoff two yeah. years ago. I yeah. mean, places like that are getting getting kids that, and then they're transferring out a lot yeah. of Pittsburgh times, had Larry Fitzgerald, dude. They did. Yeah. Yeah. They yeah, did. No, no, that's, I mean, it's crazy. Well, that's what's like interesting, too, up. is, you know, with the, COVID, with the COVID stuff, you get a lot of super senior teams, which <clears> – <throat> And and still, you're still seeing the, the effects of it as well. Yeah. The you're still seeing the effects those. of it. I mean, those true That's freshmen I mean, that year had a bunch of get that yeah, extra year. TCU yeah. last year was very old. Oak State's defense, which is so good, two years ago, was really yeah. old. Yeah. Um, you're talking was about really fourth old. and fifth year guys. Yeah. yeah. And so that. That's going away, of course. We're yeah. evolving out of that yeah. opportunity for a lot of those schools. This would It'll be probably be the last year of COVID kids, right? Yeah. yeah. Until the next plague. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Thanks, what is China. your earliest OU game memory? 
I could probably remember maybe two or three seconds from the 2000 National Championship. Uh -huh. um, How old were you at the time? Five. Okay. I was born in 95. Okay. Um, and so you're at that game. I'm at the game. Honestly, uh -huh. all I really remember is like what the like pre-game party thing. Uh -huh. like getting a smoothie with my mom. That's honestly <laughs> the only thing I remember. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Highlight of the day. Um, <laughs> maybe I remember being at the Fountain Blue, um, going down like a water slide, but uh -huh. very, very, very little. <laughs> That's fine. Um, I want to say games that I actually remember. Um, probably the Boise State Fiesta Bowl. Okay. Maybe just because it's such traumatic to OU yeah. fans. Um, it's oh, one of those things it's an that's kind of call it the an imprinting moment. Game it's, in all of college football. It's kind of hard not to remember. Oh, um, yeah. I don't really remember much of like the 2003 national championship. It would have been eight. Yeah, um, 2004. It's funny when your mind as a kid. You weren't drunk on Bourbon Street like no. the rest of us were. Yeah, yeah. no, not there <laughs> yeah. yet. Two of um, us were drunk on Bourbon Street. That, that <laughs> I, was, I was that way the next Sugar Bowl, the 13 <laughs> one. But, yeah. Um, I would probably say Boise State okay. just because it's, I mean, it's a really traumatic thing for yeah. everybody. It's kind of yeah. hard not to remember. Yeah. yeah. It's, it, it, as time has faded by, it, it, it's not is bitter for me yeah they still at, show it but they oh yeah they every year you get like the greatest it. moments you get yeah. like the uh, uh -huh. a lot oh it still hurts <laughs> you know like those youtube compilations of like you know greatest college football moments right like, greatest games there's always that's always on there. the college football 150 that they well what's out a couple funny years is ago. on that two-point conversion if a defensive player makes a heroic play, grabs that guy and, and throws him down at the one yard line, yeah. we don't hear about it. Yeah. We don't hear about it or, because it's not the upset. Or if we stop the hook and line. Even though they were yeah. favored. I still think, was it Marcus Walker? Marcus, who was the DB? Or we may have been favored and they were higher ranked. Uh, M Dub should have been on that team. If he goes, if he takes a knee at the one instead of running into the end zone. Uh, didn't we need, I, I forget, I, I, I felt like we needed that touchdown. No. We didn't? No, we could have kicked a field goal to win. Oh, t we well, we yeah. needed to score. We needed to score. Got it, got it. But if he'd have taken a knee, which yeah, you'd probably never take that, that chance, right. but we would have won that game too. Well, yeah, a lot of little things happened. Well, what I remember most about that game is the last time Adrian Peterson touched the ball, he went 25 Scored yards for a touchdown. For a touchdown, yeah. yeah. That's, that's how I choose to remember that game. Well, speaking of, of players, what players stand out in your history there that obviously in that quarterback room, there, but beyond that, what players and friendships and everything did you have that were memorable? I mean, there's a lot of them. Um, trying to think. If we go back to 2014, um, Jackson Yules was a guy I grew up with forever. Um, and he had transferred from Pitt State. Um, and so he was ineligible as well as Baker. So I spent a ton of time with Baker and Jackson that year. Um, was that scout team type stuff? No, so at that point I wasn't doing any scout team, um, but just like outside of football. No, gotcha. Um, I mean, we'd go everywhere, eat, go out, everything. Um, Were you on the intramural softball team with Baker? I was not. <laughs> um, maybe my best friend through football, and I mean, my, my closest friend in life is Nick Basquin. We were at OU the same year as 14 and 19. Um, so I think that just, you know, made mm -hmm. our relationship better just because you know you're with that person every day yeah. solidified mm -hmm. it yeah. um i got really close with creed humphrey there at the end and clayton woods um you should know. stay close to creed that yeah <laughs> he's uh, well. no, i'm close with both of them uh clayton's obviously the o-line ga he's yeah. around i worked with his brother when he's our uh he's an analyst uh he's an offensive analyst and defensive analyst and when i left he was there for a year before he went to usc um the guys I'm closest to now that are still involved would be Nick Basquin, Clayton Woods. Um, really close with Creed. He's around. Um, Dimitri Flowers, somebody I came really good friends with. Uh, we ended up going to law school together. I didn't stick around, but he just finished and graduated a couple weeks ago. Yeah, nice. yep. um, Is it I, pretty easy to form those relationships as you're it, when you're in those rooms with those guys and I, on and the, the same field, age, especially on the field and off the field, like being able to yeah, relate to them, maybe I think like so. how the coaches can. Um, I think it's, I just think of it as like, I mean, I don't, if you're any clubs or fraternity, you know, or just an intramural team, any type of club you're in, if you're with those people in class, outside of class, you share, you, you know, just kind of share migrate similar with each interests. Other. Now, yeah. How did you have to walk the line out partying or uh, in public? I didn't. Okay. Didn't at all. <laughs> okay. Um, 
He was I, a college kid at that time. Yeah, I mean, I didn't, I didn't at all. Know. I, I mean, mean even you know, as a grad assistant, you're still a college kid. I didn't know if you were sat my, down and be like, hey, listen, you can't be seen drinking with these I guys mean, or whatever. Me and Lincoln had a conversation of kind of separating when I became the GA. Um, honestly, in 2018, I didn't at all. <laughs> um, <laughs> 2019, I, I really, most of my, my good friends weren't on the team anymore. Um, like Clayton Woods was still on the team, Creed, um, Nick. Eric Swenson, some of those guys I'd actually hang out with outside of football. Um, I didn't really spend as much time like going out as I did. So it sounds like as you got later into your career there that you were really transitioning into more of a coaching like role. Yeah. If if that's a safe. It was less of like you know being associated and doing a little work, hanging out, Mm -hmm. you know, living on all the perks to more of actually having responsibilities and um, preparing and growing up sucks. Yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, so 2018, my first full-time year. So I started January 2018 until so that first year. Um, I graduated early December 2017. So that first spring would have been my last year of college, right? So Kyler's, Kyler's season. Yeah. So, I mean, I still lived it up like every other <laughs> senior, you know, going out Thursday yeah. through Saturday. Good for you. Um, and that season, which would have been my fifth year, I mean, I saw a ton of friends in school. So I do the same thing. I mean – when you want to do something, you're going to do it. I mean, even if it's sleeping three hours a night, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, you're Power still going to get up. You're going to go to work. Go to work Monday, yeah. Um, Did Jalen Hurt surprise you, his success? No. I mean, it's hard to say. You know, he was very successful at Alabama. He's a extremely talented competitor. Um, not many people I've ever seen have the dedication and work ethic he has. Um, I mean, he's serious all the time there's no messing around <laughs> um he's kind of a different personality there's not a, like when it comes to football least there's not a lot of joking and smiling like we're here to work yeah. um which was something that i haven't seen a lot of people like that he was i mean since the day he got got here um i remember driving around those first two days like trying to get him an apartment um we went apartment shopping you know yeah. um <laughs> He's just all about ball. I mm. mean, obviously, he's su- super successful at Alabama. Mm-hmm. Um, Thinking about the work ethic and his demeanor and what we see a little bit from afar, did he fit in real closely, or was he a little bit of a change and maybe even an oddball compared to the rest of the program and players? I would say there is some change, maybe a little oddball. He stood out. Um, I mean, he's a... <laughs> He's a tr- in a good way. Yeah, obviously. No, obviously. Uh, he's a true professional. I mean, um, and it takes, I would say a lot of those kids, it takes time. Um, I mean, we were all 18, 19 once. We slept through class, didn't care, you know, didn't, weren't worried about anything else. But, you know, I think he was always that serious guy from day one. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, you know, some people saw that and maybe admired it, which I think you should. Um I think some people probably followed it in his steps. Um, I think more people should probably be like that. Yeah. I mean, Do you think yeah. there was any sort of like um, maybe resentment of some guys? I'd say, say that's probably possible. Who's like, um, who are you to come in? And you know, he's show somebody kind of? who's going to push everybody around him and demand the best from them. Um, really? You know, obviously people make mistakes. I don't think he's the type of person who accepts mistakes from anybody or even himself. Which that's interesting. I don't know if I ever kind of got that. And that I think that's I think where you see he's at now it makes sense. Yeah. But in college I think my at least perception of him was he's gonna go in, he's gonna be professional within his specific area. Yeah. He's going to do everything he can to be good at that. I never not that he wasn't a leader, but I also never got the vibe of I'm gonna be the guy who's you know you look at. The Last Dance documentary where yeah. Michael Jordan is demanding everything from everyone. I don't think I ever got that vibe. So that that's an interesting insight. Maybe not to sure. that extreme. Yeah, but, but I think but he to did. An extent, right? He was the guy who's make who wanted everybody to be there on the routes, which right. everybody should be there. But even on days like it's Sunday, he's calling people up. Hey, I want to go throw. You better be there. Yeah. Mm. You know. Um, I mean, he. Like we're here to work. Like, yeah, let's go we're to here work. to work. You know, we're scholarship players. The University of Oklahoma. We're here to win. Yep. You know, we win championships, right? Let's, Let's go work. do it. Yeah. How did I bet that that was tough for Spencer? I was to say, how did Rattler handle that? He was going to be the heir apparent to start that season as a freshman. Yeah, you know, I I didn't spend a lot of time in the quarterback room um, besides spring ball when I was a GA. Um, 
during season. I mean, I got scout team stuff going on, so I, I wasn't around there as much. Um, I would, I don't really have much of an opinion on that, to be honest. I, I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, you know, it's kind of weird because you had Mordecai there as well. Um, I felt that like there's some tension there in 19, especially towards the end. Um, I remember that LSU game. I, I, had, I told Spencer and um, Mordecai to warm up, and then I, I told Spencer he was going in, and you could just kind of see the look on their faces. Some deflate. Of, some... You know, I think it kind of was telling to them of, you know, what's happening and what's, go, what's happening going forward. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So what is your relationship, if anything, with Lincoln? You obviously had a relationship, a working relationship yeah. before. It ended strangely. Do you, do you have any ongoing relationship? Um, you know, ever since I left football, I don't know if I've talked to him in person. Um, I kind of distanced myself just from, like, that life. I'd still go to the games and everything. <laughs> um, I mean, I have a ton of friends within the program that work. Um, I, I mean, I've talked to him on the phone a couple times. Um, I mean, I support him. I wish the best for him. He's, you know, he's given me some, you know, incredible opportunities. Not many people get in life. Um, you know, he kind of took me under his wing when he got here. Um, he allowed me to be his, you know, quarterback graduate assistant, which he said, you know, you get one, you know. So um, I... I went out to USC back in November and watched them play Notre Dame. Um, they, um, they let me sit on the sideline for the game. You know, it was a really cool experience. Um, I didn't get to talk to him, but I mean, I, I support him. Um, I don't have any ill will against him. Um, How surprising was it when he left? I mean, I was as shocked as you guys were. I mean, honestly, it kind of hurt. Um, I think it hurt more for me because you guys – as you guys know, when a head coach leaves or gets fired, everybody on the staff doesn't have a job, right? Right. Yeah. Um, so I kind of looked at it as like, fuck, like my dad doesn't have a job, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, um, you know, a lot of my friends are huge Oklahoma fans and they're just talking, you know, F Link and all this stuff. I'm like, guys, like, you don't, you don't understand. Like, yeah, I don't know where yeah. my family's going to be in two months, yeah. you know? Mm-hmm. You, you, um, you bring it to a very personal level that even sometimes myself and us maybe in this whole yeah. group we don't we yeah we're not we, attached we to dis, it. we discount yeah. right yeah. and yeah. and i while we can acknowledge we can acknowledge the effect and the impact that something like that has it's more of a passing conversation that leads into well you know ill will or yeah. bitterness more yeah. so than anything else so yeah, that, i mean that's a, that's a really interesting thing um, for sure yeah i mean i was i was hurt it really caught me by surprise i remember that you know, that post-game press conference after the OSU game, and he's like, what do you say? I'm not going to be the next the LSU, LSU yeah. job. So everybody's relieved, right? You yeah. know, then we wake up Sunday, and it's like he's gone. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> so was – and you saw it from one perspective on the inside that we didn't get a chance to see, but would you say that Lincoln Riley was or is predictable as an offensive coordinator? I would say predictable to an extent. I mean, everybody knows the offense, right? Um, yep. He, the, <laughs> he's, been trying to get, he's been trying to get hired on by Pac-12 we, coaches. I have a 78% rate of um, guessing his play calls correctly from the end zone. We, I mean, that's, it's the base offense that started however long ago with Hal Mummy and, you know, Leach and everybody runs. It's the same play names to an extent. Um I mean, we – It's still unstoppable. <laughs> ran, I mean, when I went out to that USC game – um, I could hear some of the calls, same names. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Give us an example of that because, you know, you hear a lot of when John Gruden talks, it's yeah. spider Y banana so 33X or whatever. It's the most simple. So your base, like your, your base drop back passes, it's called, they're in the 90s. Yeah, tell, tell Utah um, what they need to do this. <laughs> so, like, no, they gotta figure your out. formations <laughs> are one word. So two by two formations, ace, ace, right here, ace. Um, a, a scheme, 95. Ace 95, that tells them everything. They know it's crown protection. The quarterback's going to tell the line crown. He's going to signal 95, we're going. What, is, what does crown mean? Uh, Six-man pass pro. So backs in, check, and whatever his so route is. Sort of a max protection. So no max protection. Okay. Max protection would be different. It's all really simple, though. All right. So the, the, the running back is staying put, though, to help block So he's, he's check if he's, you know, obviously six-man 
blo it's six man pressure. He's in. If, if it's he's not, not, he's gonna check. Then he's gonna release. Yeah. Um, Ninety five. I mean, everybody knows there were outs. Uh, so, so is that like, where so he's... like X Y Z has the X, route H, for H Y Z? So okay. I give you ninety five. X is a vertical. H is speed out. Y is an over. Z is a post curl. So is that why we saw with stuff like that, with that simplicity, why we saw guys like Dimitri Flowers at the fullback position be so successful is because of play calls and schemes like that. Dimitri, Meech, he was very successful because he's an extremely intelligent player. Yeah. Um, and he'll admit this. He's not the best athlete out there. He's not the fastest. He's not the strongest. But he knows how to play the game. You know, he's got a niche for, you know, feeling and how to release, how to run routes, you know, how to break routes, where to sit. Um, you know, we'd run a lot of plays with him where he's blocking down and he releases. Yeah. Um, he's just got a – he's a gamer. I mean, he's a yeah. gamer. He's – just has a feel for it. Um, I mean, Dimitri Flowers, in a nutshell, to me, like his, def like at least for me, and his whole career, the defining moment was that middle release that he had against Ohio State, where he yeah. catches it and runs, and it's like, oh, he's. I mean, it's going to be a good 15 yard game. He did yeah, it he just too. slipping, yeah, slipping around. Same, we'd everybody. run the same play, yeah. just different formations. <laughs> um, so, how complicated was it all? How many plays? How many formations? Did it, does he rely more on? Um, one or the other in terms of keeping it uh, off balance for the defense? So we really wouldn't throw in a lot of special formations very often. Um, maybe like a goal line or third down. Um, we'd really run the same plays every week for the most part. But what Lincoln did when he was – what he's able to do is he picks out, let's say, seven to ten plays every week. And those are the plays they're probably going to score. So those are the plays, like you see Marquise make a double move and just split the middle of the field and catch a seven-yard touchdown. That's one of those plays. Um, so those like scripted, essentially. Like yeah, you so know going our, in with their vulnerable on, yeah. and those seven plays are going to be dynamite. So our, and everything else built around it is just some first downs. Yes, yeah, so our script would be we'd go open field and go 10 personnel, 11 personnel, 20 personnel. Let's, let's say there would be – 10, 10 personnel plays, but that's ace. That's two by two. That's trips right, trips left. Um, basically, I mean, for the most part in that offense, you can run any play out of any formation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we're in a game and we like how we're seeing something, we might not even, we might start running a play that's not even on the script, but it's one of our base plays that we've ran a thousand times. Um, Just in a different iteration with, with a formation. Yeah, that, yeah. So, I, what, to be successful in that offense, especially as a receiver, you need to know your route and everybody else's route on every play. And that's why some guys like Demetri Flowers are so successful because he could go out there and he could play Y. And Y was like Mark Andrews, Sterling Shepard, Lee Morris, Grant Calcaterra. Or he could go to the other side and play H. Um, H is your smaller guys like Nick Basquin played H. But H, when we'd go in 11 personnel, H is in the backfield. So that's where Meech was the H in the backfield. Um, We'd run a lot of base stuff, to be honest. We'd run, you know, our uh, GT scheme, you know, guard tackle pullers. Um, yeah. We killed everybody in the Big 12 on that. Yeah, yeah. Um, GT counter, his, all that yeah. stuff, yeah. Does his offense depend more so than others on a superstar quarterback or superstar play? I would say you just got to have a guy who can throw the ball. I mean, if you look at – I mean, everybody runs a form of it, whether it's, you know, my Uncle Mike ran it forever, Dana runs it. Um, Mike Leach, obviously, but I think the difference is, you know, like Mike Leach and them, they throw for 4,000 yards a season, but go what seven and five. Yeah. We had a lot better players. Um, none of those guys could run the ball like we could. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what separated Lincoln from all those other, you know, air raid offenses. Cause we'd go out and run the ball 20, 30 times yeah. a game for 200, 200 offensive yards. lines. How much of that was beating bow and how much of that is scheming. So I think when, when Bob brought Lincoln in, he wanted to go back to, like, you know, the spread, air raid type offense. But I think he, you know, he made it clear, I want to run the ball still. It's Oklahoma. We run the ball, right? After we the have, Texas game in 15, that was the, yeah. the uh, we, preach. We have, you know, NFL running backs year in and year out. We have NFL linemen all over the place. We're going to pound people. We're going to run the ball. So I think that's the difference is, is Lincoln was able to adapt to that. 
And obviously his first offense, his two running backs were Joe Mixon and Samaj P. Ryan. Yeah. I mean, you got two NFL players. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Not just Joe Mixon, is a, he's a Heisman talent player. Which yeah. Lincoln probably had to adjust to coming from ECU, where yeah. it's just not what he had. Yeah, and, you know, they, they ran the ball to ECU. It was more simple zone, outside zone, um, 30 base. They didn't really run the GT like we were now. Um, I mean, GT became our base, base mm -hmm. run play. So you brought up something that is interesting. You contrast a little bit with Mike. Ex explore that a little bit. So your uncle's had tremendous success at Oklahoma State. Definitely a second-tier program, so he's got a headwind right there that it's going to be more difficult to win there. You're yeah. not going to get the recruits. I know we have a different view probably on the Oklahoma State program than you do because your entire life was your uncle running it, and we have a different history there. Um, we don't root for him the same way you probably root for him <laughs> and, and to succeed. But he's unde undeniably had tremendous success relative to the program. He's yeah. their most successful coach. How different is the way he conducts an offense and the way his, his strategies work compared to, say, Lincoln? So I've, it's hard to say because I've never been in those rooms. Um, I would say I feel like one thing that he's always done is he gets the most out of his players. I agree with that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> There's no question there. I, I have yeah. a hard time answering that just because I've never been in those rooms. I've never sure. been in those off. I don't know their OCs. I don't, I've never been around them and, you know, in a They've football gone through sense. a bunch of OCs too. Yeah. And he's had a ton of great ones, whether it's, yeah. you know, Dana or Fedora. Yeah. Um, and that probably speaks loudly to your, to Mike a lot is through all those transitions, he's still consistently producing yeah. success on the field. surprisingly right? consistently producing success. I mean, yeah, we, we sent out the tweet going. the other day, the longest uh, longest winning season streak, yeah. and they were fourth or fifth on the list with like 15 straight or yeah. something like that. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it, it is a testament to what he has done there. And I, I, think, I think he will be. I don't, I don't anticipate anybody else being a considered a better coach at Oklahoma State than what Mike Gundy is. Be very, I think, very hard I think to get when, there. when Mike leaves, I think it is going to be, I don't want to say a downturn in the program, but it's going to be it's going to be tough to recover from. Yeah, well, it's a sure. stepping stone job for like a Les Miles and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah, it's I a stepping agree. stone but job Jimmy for 99% of the coaches Jimmy who are going to go there. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, Mike's through and through. I mean, So they're going to obviously be in the Big 12 without Oklahoma after next year. Yeah. Um, what, what do you think that does for Oklahoma State? Where do you think they position themselves versus the other teams? Not just the teams coming in, but maybe more importantly, the teams that are in the conference now that have established themselves. Yeah, so you'll still have, you know, TCU, still have K-State. I would say those are your best two teams, right? I mean, does anybody disagree? TCU, K-State would probably be your best two? I think, yeah. I think so. Baylor's got to be pretty competitive. Ba I would say Baylor's. Baylor's there and getting better than Texas Tech. Like Texas we talked yeah. about earlier, they're yeah. getting yeah. better. Right? I'm gonna have yeah. to see more than just the one year from TCU. Um, I think know, Sonny Dykes is a good coach. I was, they were old. I was really yeah. surprised that he didn't go to Tech because his that's, dad. Yeah. Did, I mean, that's the one of the first job. road game. Well, <laughs> not probably the third or fourth road game that we went to together was mm -hmm. in Lubbock on Spike Dykes' last home game okay. when yeah. we lost yeah. to Cliff Kingsbury. Came in as a third quarterback off the bench yeah. and beat us, and it was horrible. But Spike Dykes was a legend at Texas. Tech. So I'm really surprised that that, that wasn't Sonny's So job. I think you're talking, you know, you still got K-State, TCU, which TC. I think K-State's there to stay. Yeah. I think yeah. K-State will continue to be one of the top teams in the Big 12. And I think mm -hmm. Baylor's up there too. I think TCU's going to go up and down. Um, mm -hmm. They have a lot going for them. You know, they're in the DFW. They're, gonna, they're always going to have good skill players, which they always have and they always will. Um, you know, Baylor – I'm not sold on Aranda, to be honest. You know, they – I don't know. They ha He hasn't shown me since he's been there that they're going to be great. Well, they definitely slipped this past year. Yeah. Now, the two things that both – you mentioned Baylor and Texas Tech have going for them is Texas money. Yep. They've got oil money. They've got big donors. K-State's got tremendous fan support. Mm -hmm. You probably saw it when you were there on the sidelines yeah. and everywhere else. We saw it in the stands. They show up for that. Team. They do. And I think, I think, and I think they have recruiting to their advantage in that area as well. They do. You know, K State takes players that we don't recruit. That OU doesn't recruit. OSU probably doesn't recruit. A lot of Tulsa guys. They take. You know, they've, they they have the they have a stronghold there in Tulsa. They always have, and they get those kids. They 
they recruit, you know, a lot of Kansas kids nobody else takes. They, you know, they develop their players. I so think Kleiman, I mean, they'll have legitimately playing for them for the next 50 years. Yeah. Probably. I think Kleiman's a legitimately um, good coach as well. Though. So yeah, I agree. Their, their tight end coach, Brian LePac, um, somebody I'm really close with, he played at OU. Uh, he went to law school at OU after he got them playing. He went to uh, Indiana to be Wilson's uh, O-line GA. He came back to OU, so he was the O-line GA with me. He's their tight end coach, and he, I've talked to him about it a few times, and he, he's, he loves the guy. He thinks he's awesome. Um, he was one of the names we mentioned when Lincoln left. We, we said Venables and Kleiman, Kleiman yeah. and then Aranda. We, we talked about Aranda, but that was, that was pretty much our list was those three guys, honestly. So I guess going back to the, you know, the, the post-OU Texas Big 12, um, you know, West Virginia has gone downhill. Yeah. yeah. They've since what 2012 2013 yeah. they've just continued to go downhill ever since they, they were lost good in eight, they were good in 18 that was a they, flash in the pan they were good in 2018 they had that little run there with dana at the end um but since then they haven't been good at all doesn't seem like they're serious about football either no i don't know if the if the location mm-hmm. just hurts them somehow i, well, yeah, I think the, so. the conference that they're playing in has no ground yeah, in, it, you know, it's there. weird because they recruit up and down the East Coast. They get yeah. a ton of Florida kids. Yeah. Um, but they just haven't had success in the last three or four years. Um, who else is there? How about the ones coming in? How about Dana and Houston? Yeah, but... I, I don't mean, think they, they were, care about They haven't been very Houston. good the last couple of years either. Yeah. yeah. And they just lost a bunch of players. And they lost a bunch of starters. They have the ingredients to be good. They're in a hotbed of recruiting, so, but, so but my, they're just my not dad, a program We've talked about this it. forever. If Houston was in the Big 12, they could be one of the best programs. Um, obviously, you saw the, the changes now because of NIL and the portal, but, I mean, it's Houston. You yeah. don't have to leave the city of the recruits. Right. I mean, there's, Theoretically. there's probably 100 players from Houston that are D1 players, maybe more. So yeah. will they make a run coming up into the Big 12? I don't know. I mean, C- I don't Cincinnati's know. got a – Ohio's a hotbed for recruiting, too. I, Cincinnati's going to go downhill has after Fickle Lee. After I, I, I agree with that. Yeah. And I think, you know, if this was – if we didn't have NIL, I think this would be a different conversation. Just because Houston and Cincinnati, they don't have the money that Texas, you know, down the street or Ohio State has. So those kids that they could go get because Ohio State or, or you know, Texas, Texas A&M, didn't offer A and M, they'll they, they can get those they can get those kids, but they can't pay them. So they may go there for a year, but then they're leaving. Um, and they probably don't have a donor base who wants to pay them. Yeah, they're just not no. interested in it. I don't think they do. So. I want to transition to something. Um, we can come back to that because you've got a lot to share on that too. But uh, I don't want to have you uh, sit here and not tell us a little bit about what it's being, what it's like being a coach's son. Yeah. So what, what was the fun stuff and the difficulty, especially when you were young? I imagine that's a very demanding job with weird hours. Yeah. He's off on recruiting trips. He is um, late nights, especially during the season. He's probably spending – Spend a Crazy lot of time with other kids, too. Yeah. yeah. What is that like? You know, it's different. I, it's the only lifestyle I know. So, um, you know, there's a lot of time he was gone, obviously. Um, I think my dad did the best he could to be at everything he could. Um, you know, whether it was, you know, football games in the fall, um, which we played on Sundays over at Reeves. So mm-hmm. that was, you know, he could go to those games. But I, I, I'd say this point needs to be made that Bob Stoops did an incredible job of like allowing his staff to be fathers. Um, that was very mm. important to Bob that they, you know, they're around their kids. Um, we well, did him this. being a coach's son was probably yeah. a lot of that because he, yeah. he probably didn't get to see his dad as much he, as he wanted to. Um, you know, and Lincoln was the same way. And I, there's a lot of guys like this. And there's some who aren't. They don't want you missing your kids, whether it's a game, a recital, you know. They want you to be a father. Um, you know, that's the most important thing. Mm-hmm. You know, you're a father. You're a football coach, but you're a father. I mean, mm-hmm. family goes first. Um, you know, he there's stuff he missed, but, I mean, I understood. Um, I mean, I get it. It's the only life I knew. And, you know, my other friends, whether it's like Caleb Wilson and some other kids, I, they were going through the same thing. So that's kind of all I knew. Mm-hmm. Um, and they brought you guys around the program yeah, a lot as well, and right? So we do family dinner every, uh, I think, every Wednesday night. So everybody go up there Wednesday night. We'd eat dinner together, all the coaches, all the families. Um, That's awesome. So that was always a cool thing. Um, and it was just it's you and just your sister, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, my dad coached some of my baseball teams when I was little in the spring and the summer, mm. um, up until I was probably like 11, 10, mm-hmm. 11. Um, 
So, you know, it's a different experience. I would say I got closest with my dad in college. Um, I would say my relationship changed a lot with him once I got to college just because I was with him every day. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, whether it's meetings or games or like we roomed together on all the road trips. <laughs> That's special. Yeah. That's um, nice. So, I mean, Monday through Friday, whether it was in season or out of season, there's a set time from 2 to 6, probably 2 to 6 p.m. I was around them every day mm-hmm. or Monday through Friday, mm-hmm. um, which is, I mean, I don't think most kids get to see their parents like that, especially in college. Um, no, yeah. for sure not. No. So, Having that unsolicited time is, um, yep. you know, I was getting to spend time with them every day. And, you know, Friday nights on road trips, we'd go to dinner, me and my dad and Beaton Bow, Drew Hill, Woody, you know, all the guys. That was kind of like our deal on road games. We'd go eat Friday nights. Um, it's, you know, it's a really cool relationship. Um, I think it's kind of hard to explain unless you've experienced it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I would, I think the only way I, you could really compare it to be somebody in the military, maybe, mm-hmm. but probably not to the extreme because people get deployed and they're gone for six months. Well, my dad wasn't gone for six months. He was busy for six months, but you know, he wasn't gone. Um, well, something that you mentioned earlier while we were walking back from dinner thinking about the military kid um, and lifestyle military family, you didn't have to suffer through what a lot of mil- uh, military and coaches families do where the guy is moving between programs all the time. Sir. You had the the benefit of being yep. able to be in this one place this whole time. That's got to be really nice. Yeah, I mean, I'm the only coach's kid that, besides Stoops, you know, uh-huh. people that are here that live basically their entire life in one spot. That's awesome. Um, we lived almost four years in Birmingham. I don't remember any of it. Um, I was born in Midwest City. We moved out there and I was three weeks old. We moved back when I was almost four. So I I don't remember any of it. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, like my uncle Mike, he moved back from Maryland, 2001, Mm -hmm. 2002. So my cousin Gavin, I mean, he was born in Waco and they went to Maryland, but I don't think he remembers any of that. So, Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's different. Um, like we were talking about earlier, I have a couple of friends that went to three high schools. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, mm-hmm. one, Caleb Wilson, he was in Starkville, Mississippi, Athens, Georgia. Then they were out in, in L.A. I mean, that's that's a lot of moving. That's a um, lot of moving. And well, it's got to be special, too, to have the, the family, extended family. you yep. got your cousin and your uncle um, where everybody, one, they understand the business because they're, they're all in the business. Yep. Or, the you know, the two big breadwinners that are in the business, they... They sort of an understanding and probably build around that to understand how to, to do it all. I would imagine it's a little tough going out to dinner. Your dad gets recognized. Obviously, your uncle would get recognized. Yeah. It's got to be a little semi-celebrity lifestyle when you're around here. Uh, maybe a little. Not I mean, too bad. It's nothing special. Um, <laughs> you know, it's more people saying, hey, coach. Yeah. Um, it's not like people are harassing or anything. No, um, no. I think just more like the attention. And it's really just in Oklahoma. I mean, you go yeah. out of town, I mean, nobody know. knows who my dad is. That's, um, that's kind of a nice feature. People <laughs> might recognize Mike, especially right. because of the hair and stuff. I was going to say, um, with or without the mullet. <laughs> yeah, well, and just his viral moments. But, um, <laughs> what? What viral moments? <laughs> <laughs> go to He's YouTube. a man, he's 40. <laughs> what are you talking Batter about? Is, is, you know, his post-game <laughs> dancing. And, oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think all, all those things is, is sometimes cringeworthy and, and strange as they are. They're also um, kind of admirable, especially when he was defending his players and yeah. standing up for them. So this is this is cool. kind of on topic. What is Thanksgiving like? Is it family? Go is watch it family Nine. They did a special one. <laughs> is it just football? What is it? It's just family. I mean, don't they didn't? I mean, the one story that I watched about the Gundy Thanksgiving because it was always up until. Mid two thousands, late late twenty two thousands, we played OSU game yeah, every, after Thanksgiving. Every right. Saturday after Thanksgiving. Right. Yeah. So I, I remember they did one special on the on the Gundy family, and um, I remember seeing. You know, we strictly don't talk about football. We, do, we I don't mean, talk. We talk football. I mean, but you don't it, talk about. It just about, wouldn't be you know. like OU. It wouldn't be Bedlam. Right. I mean, we'd sit there and. Who Texas and Texas Tech would always play on Thursday, right? And te- Texas, Texas a name would play on Friday. Yes, yeah. yeah. So, you yeah. know, whoever's playing, we'd watch. You'd talk ball, talk other things. I mean, I brought, I think my sophomore year, I was living with Mark Andrews, Wesley Horky, Alex Dalton, and Carson Meyer. I brought all four of them. Um, they came, and that's <laughs> and then Joe Mixon came too. And that's, you know, five guys who played two nights wow. before Bedlam. I mean, nobody cares. Um, and your dad, and, your dad and Joe were real close, right? Yeah, no, we're really close with Joe. Um, 
I haven't made it up to Cincinnati yet. I'm hoping to this fall, but we've gotten to watch him play in Kansas City the last two playoffs. Nice. Um, he's taken care of us both those games, giving us incredible tickets. Um, How does that feel when you see like Creed yeah. on the Chiefs and you got Joe and P Ryan on on Cincinnati playing well, each and, other? And you it's got kind of a rough. You got Blake Bell, who yeah. I went yeah. to school with. I'm close yep. with. Yeah. The, uh, who do you root for? Yeah, Winchester. I. I you root for football. I lean towards the Bengals. Um, <laughs> okay. I mean, I like them both, but I, I I would say I was biased towards the Bengals in those games. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I support the Chiefs too. I mean, I'm really close with Creed and Blake. They're, um, I mean, they both live around here. Blake lives in Moore, right down the street from both of us. Um, what uh, what did you have an NFL team growing up? So don't tell me you're a Dallas Cowboys. Fan. I didn't have. <laughs> He's a Patriots fan. So it's weird. I'm not really a fan of any team. Hmm. I would say the only one I've always kind of liked the Yankees, um, whether it's, you know, Jeter and those guys. I was a big Mark Teixeira fan when he got traded there or he got signed there. Um, I don't really have any pro teams. I I really root for players. So NFL, I root for players. Um, Same. Gravitate towards stories and yeah, you can get I, behind one, and then I, next season you might be rooting for somebody it, completely it's, different. It's really just guys I know. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like I, I went out back in October. I went to a Cardinals game. Kyler got me tickets. Mm-hmm. I, I, you know, I support Kyler. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, wherever Baker's at, it's just any of those guys. I mean, I, I want the best for them. I mean, same with others like NBA. I just root for players and give us a prediction because you've got a little bit of insight into the three of them between. Kyler Baker and Jalen, who at the end of the day is going to have the best NFL career? I would probably say Jalen, and he's got the head start. It's a head start, and it's you know it's it's you know it's great to be the first pick in the draft and everything. But what does that mean? You're going to the worst franchise <laughs> yeah. in football, right? So you're going to be on the worst roster on the worst team. Um, Jalen got drafted to a team that a couple of down years, but has you know. Hall of Fame players. Yeah. One of the best offensive lines ever played football. An, an organization um, and a fan base that wants yes. to win football games. Yeah, and they won a Super Bowl in 2016, mm-hmm. you know, not too long ago. Um, you know, that's the difference is what could Baker or Kyler do on that team? Mm-hmm. Maybe they couldn't do what Jalen does. I don't know. But I know I've watched a lot of Kyler's games, and he's running for his life every play. Yep. Mm-hmm. You know, if he had an offensive line, if you know, if he got drafted to the Cowboys, for instance. It's a lot better roster than the Cardinals. Um, I would just say off projections right now, I, I couldn't say it's not going to be Jalen. Mm-hmm. Um, He's definitely know. set up for the most success, yeah. for I, sure. I, I think, at least, well, and their skill. I mean, between Smith and A.J. Brown. Um, I mean, what Baker Goddard. did at the Browns was incredible based yeah. on their, yeah. Yeah. their well, lifelong you know, they, of It's crazy losing. that the fan base looks at it the way they look at it, too. But that's the Browns. Yeah, uh, yeah it's, the Browns. it's ridiculous that they turned on him kind of like um, they did. You know, they had, what what they go, 11-5 and five one year? They had mm-hmm. two pretty good years there, right? They won, yeah. a, playoff I mean, they won a playoff against game. Against Pittsburgh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and 16. Playoff. I mean, yeah. they, they, yeah, they, were, they were a touchdown away from going to the AFC Championship. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I I just think Jalen and the situation he's in, they have such a good mix of old and young talent, right? They have an O-line where they drafted uh, what's Dickinson from Bama. Yeah. Um, and Mylotta, the left tackle, is a young guy. And you got, you know, Kelsey and Lane, they're old guys. But they got two or three more years in them, right? Yeah. Lane can yeah. stay healthy. Um, yeah. They got two all-pro – I mean, I don't – I'm assuming A.J. Brown's an all-pro receiver. Yeah. Um, Devontae Smith will be there. Dallas Goddard's, you know, one of the best tight ends. They have – and those guys will probably play there the rest of their career. So he's got three three skill players who's not going to lose, I don't think. He's got an O line of you know two Hall of Fame guys that will retire in the next let's say two or three years. But he's got two young guys who are great players. The defense is a mix of young and old players. That yeah, they've are only really drafted good. Bama and Georgia. Yeah, they only players, they so. only put all their first, second round picks in defensive players. And they have an year. offensive coordinator that tailors the game for yeah. Jalen Hurts. Yeah, but that, and I mean the, his skill set. Yeah, with with an offensive coordinator that is willing to let him run is, it's unstoppable. Yeah. Really, well, and the, you, it, it seems like at least from the outside looking in, you have a team that is bought in to what they're trying to do. Yeah, you've got a lot of guys who want to be there, and whereas you know you go and you look at the Cardinals, where they have guys like DeAndre Hopkins, but Hopkins is a little. No. Egotistical. There's a lot you know of guys I mean? there. Just so, I, mean, I don't know how many check. people bought in on exactly. Kingsbury either. There, mm-hmm. honestly. So I mean, yeah. it's 
it'll be interesting to see see that. I'm I'm excited to see Baker in Tampa. I think that's I too. that'll be yep. interesting to see. I agree. So they have a good roster. Yeah, yeah. Mike Evans coach. is a beast, so he's yeah. got that going. Yeah, forward. I mean you've, you've and uh, Godwin. I mean he's Godwin. A, he's a yep. Damn yeah. good receiver. Yeah. Yeah. Baker's got it on his on his fingertips. So we'll see. I I think it's pretty cool to get an insider's insight into that who's seen those guys and and been around those guys for I, sure. I think we can't count out Baker or Kyler yet either. I mean those guys. I mean, they're Heisman winners and number one picks for a reason. They have tons of talent and ability. And they're, um, it, 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 like you said, if they're not running for their yeah, lives, I think, what can they you do? You know, Baker showed he could be a decent quarterback out there. He had some success I there. mean, I, I think decent's not giving him enough credit yeah. for, for how, much, right. how much at bad, how bad his offensive line was, really. Yeah. Other, pass blocking. Yeah. For some reason, that offensive line could run block oh, yeah. because they had two running backs that could get the job done. But it didn't seem like he had enough time to throw open his receivers because on the pass on the passing plays it's just they want to you got to get you got to get coordinators who want who want to tailor their game like like well, they're Baker doing for Jay. Yeah, he had four four, four, years? four yeah. offensive yeah. coordinators. And, yeah. and that's not fair to him either, yeah, you not know. At all. Um, yeah, we're talking about new, nom- new nomenclature, yeah. new schemes. I mean, it's, having well, to learn Baker that gonna every year. going to have 6 in 6 years now? Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's crazy. I mean, he's been on three NFL teams in the last year. Rams, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that would be his it's fifth. It's fifth, and then Tampa's sixth. His sixth. Yeah. And um, Carolina. Well, we have some listener questions. Oh, Carolina. He's going to say that. We yeah. have some wow. listener questions, it's... but before we get to those, I have a question for you. I want you to uh, apply your analysis skills to the quarterback situation at OU coming into 2023. How do you evaluate that? And don't hold back. Uh, let us know what you think about it. Where do you think it's going to go? How successful can they be? Um, et cetera. Um. I mean, I think Dylan's your guy, obviously. Um, I think Dylan's a good quarterback. He's, you know, he's done a good job. I, I think a lot of people expect him to be a Jalen Baker, Kyler, and I, I just, I don't think that's him. Um, I think they might have expected it last, last year, year, not yeah. so much this year. <laughs> yeah, right. But you know, he, oh, you had a good offense last year, in my opinion. Yeah. They maybe they didn't throw the ball as good as you had hoped, but they, I mean, they ran the ball. They scored points, right? Um, I think we had trouble in third and shorts situations. They, they struggle in third we downs. We didn't really have a power. We had a lot back. of three and outs in general. Yeah. Um, I was, think well, the, the clock downs, management was horrific yeah. last third season. Third downs might have been a struggle. Um, I mean, I Dylan's your guy in my opinion. Um, Do you think Jackson Arnold can take the job from him? I don't. I I think the there's two reasons why Jackson Arnold will be on the field. One, to use his four games to uh, keep his red shirt at the end of the games. Or, well, t- or two, things are going really, really, like worst case scenario, and you got to take Dylan out. Or injury. Or injury. Or injury. Yeah. yeah. How do yeah. you, at, when, did you watch, you watch every game, even if you're not there? I watch most of them. Most of them. <laughs> um, I, even when I was still going the games, I'd sit in suites and I wouldn't watch games. I'd yeah. go up and down, talk to Just people, talk to, have yeah. fun. Um, what is it like? Do you, do you get frustrated with clock management and, and the, the minutia of stuff? That like That's the stuff I focus it, on a lot. It's really easy to get frustrated with a lot of things you see. Um, you know, it's not specifically OU, but a lot of, you know, lesser teams or teams that aren't as good you know there's a lot of times you sit there and you're like this guy's making this much money he doesn't know how to do this you know stuff like that and i'm sure you know fans see that the same way but you know you can when you when you're in the profession you spend so much time in it you see things that the common fan doesn't whether it's you know schemes or tendencies and you're like well why aren't you doing this you know like the offense coordinator is making five hundred thousand dollars. Does he not see this or a million dollars? You know, or the head coach is making. Well, that's how we. That's how we feel about clock management or timeouts. And like, is there, is there nobody on the sideline, sc- literally screaming like? So I, I don't run the stop ball. snapping the football with nineteen seconds yes. left on the clock so when you're trying to preserve a lead. Like, what I, are you doing? I never worked with with these with Levy in this offense, mm. with Lincoln. Lincoln's on top of everything when it comes to football. We, we're talking everything. We're going over everything. Um, one of the things I was responsible for during plays was 10-second clock. So when it got down 10 seconds, I had to let him know. Um, if, it, you know if we got to delay a game, I only had one time it was my fault. Every other time it was his fault. <laughs> what did he say to you? A lot. I, honestly, <laughs> I, I, I don't even remember. It's uh, great to have somebody the game? To do that, though. Yeah, it was uh, 
TCU at TCU 2018. Um, Grant caught a ball or got hurt and came off and he was talking to me. And actually, I checked. It wasn't my fault. So they TCU <laughs> was setting the play clock. We'll, re we'll review the film. T yeah. I, I checked it. TCU, oh, yeah. <laughs> TCU was setting the play clock to 25 instead of 40 between plays. So, oh. you know, after every play, there's 40 second 40, play clock, right. right? So they were setting at the 25 and starting it immediately. So you should have 15 seconds, then the 25 starts, right? So that 25 is starting immediately. Okay, so, okay, but not to interrupt you. Why does something like that not get relayed to officials immediately, and why do they not adjust to it immediately? Because people aren't paying attention. Okay. Um, mm. So, yeah, so Grant, I think Grant caught a ball and, like, had a stinger, and he came off, and he's talking to me. And this is maybe, what, 15 seconds later? I mean, we're talking yeah. not, a, not a lot of time. Mm -hmm. The next thing, like, a couple seconds later, I look up, we get to delay a game. And, I mean, I, I can't even – there's a lot of motherfucks <laughs> and fucks and uh, where the fuck are you? And I was just kind of like – I was like, man, the play just ended 10 seconds ago. I, go, I, I don't know what happened. Um, and so on Sundays, I'd, every Sunday I'd have to go back and watch the game tape, mm -hmm. look for signals, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I saw that it is set in the 25. <laughs> and I was like, man, fuck that. Like, that kind of pissed me off. Like, you know, everybody's looking at me, getting getting yelled at on the sideline. It's not even my fault. And I, I was like, I went there. I was like, coach, man, they're set at 25. He's like, yeah, I just don't let it happen again. I was like, okay. Is, is there <laughs> I'll make sure of, they don't do that on yeah. the clock again. Is You're there right. a lot of signal stealing? Yeah, I mean, there is. Um so we had taken so 2017 TC. You guys might remember the play. Uh, we had their crash signal. Uh, we had a play. I want to say we called it Cowboy. Rodney Anderson. They brought crash. Went out to show that he's blocking the corner release. We hit it. Rodney up going up our sideline. Yep. Um, there is signal stealing, but like with Lincoln's offense, we go so fast for the most part. It doesn't matter. It's same signals for years. Mm -hmm. yeah. Same formations everybody's using for years. Mm -hmm. Same play calls, same signals. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, you got to think, you could still signal, but there's a lot of shit going on. Um, so if I'm in the box stealing signals and I'm on the defensive staff, I got to wait till the defense coordinator is done yelling. Look, they all do. They're all freaking <laughs> out every play, right? So by, that, by the time he's done yelling and freaking out, there's probably 10 seconds left on the play clock. I'm like, hey, it's, you know, they're running four, four verts, four verts. So by the time he hears that, like, figures it out, it doesn't matter, yeah. right? Defense can adjust. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, a guy like, you know, Gary Patterson ran their defense. Um, he's the only signal guy. He's over there freaking out the whole time doing signals as soon as the play's over. So you can get stuff like that. Hmm. I mean, you can, like, I can watch a USC game and I can watch and I can pick up all their signals for the most part, unless it's new formations or plays that they changed. Um, which, you know, year by year we change signals sometimes on some stuff, but... I just, it's not like baseball where you mm -hmm. can say, you can, you know, pick up curveball. And if you're on second base, you can sure. put your hands on your head and that means it's curveball, right? Or if you're the Yankees, you know, you're sending a couple of beeps or hitting the roof of the, <laughs> the dugout. Yeah. Um, what are you hearing in your headphones on the sideline? So there's a, when I was, when I was coaching, most of the conversation was between Lincoln and my dad. So my dad was up in the box. He was the eyes. Um, so Lincoln would, you know, he'd have, talks with my dad during you know between plays during plays like hey what, what do you think blah 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 um and then he'd want to know what's going on so we on fridays we'd have already talked about where everybody's looking at pre-play so um you know my dad's looking at the z up top ty darlington's looking at the y we're looking at the two receivers on our side stuff like that or ty's looking at rotation in the, uh in the back or in the uh secondary so they're stuff looking like at that. far side because they're up top. Yeah, so okay. stuff like that, which we've already covered all this on Friday. Everybody knows what they're supposed to be doing. So a lot of it, you know, my dad be like, you know, two safeties, uh, they're, rolling, they're rolling strong here. Um, stuff like that. Um, which unless there's a lot of time left, you'll see Lincoln change plays pretty late a lot of times. Um, which he did. I mean, he's not afraid to make a play call late, you know, change things up. If we're like, oh, we're getting edge from the field here. Let's run outside zone into it. Stuff like that. Does he let his quarterbacks make a lot of decisions? Yes. Question yeah, as well. okay. So <laughs> he, I think, I know, like I, I wasn't around in like hypo meetings in 2014, so I can't speak on a lot of that stuff. Lincoln does a, a tremendous job of, 
of preparing the quarterbacks week in and week out. We go through, um, so our scout team, when we go against scout team, we'd give you every look, every blitz, every look possible, and we'd go full speed. So he would spend time in the meetings coaching all those. He'd let the guys just play. During practice, we'd play, you know, you fuck up, you fuck up. We'll, we'll talk about it after, right? So by the time Saturday comes around, you've seen that blitz and every coverage imaginable with it. So you've seen every look. So those guys, you know, they know their cues. Um, I think Lincoln does a tremendous job with that. I think that's a big part of him developing quarterbacks and their success. Um, you see those guys making checks all the time. Uh, whether it's Baker, Kyler, Jalen. Are they watch. controlled checks then because they've got a, a, a repertoire of what they can run through? So there, there are control checks. I mean, sometimes you might look over and say, I got CD's lamb at X and <laughs> I like him versus that corner. I'm throwing a fade to him. I'm, you know, I'm How do they six. communicate that? How does, yeah, how does he, CD know that? Uh, signal. So um, just a little signal this. That's vertical. This would be vertical. Okay. So um, how does Lincoln give the that's good go? So lots of times you see like Kyle, so there's, there's two ways. He might give them like two plays. He'd give them the signal and then tell them, think about, maybe think about, I don't know, um, Mets, which is GT to the right. Um, or he might look over there and somebody's like, man, you got a good matchup over there at X. And you know, sometimes whether the quarterback Baker might see it, you know, Baker might be like, you know, like I got CD lamb over there. So um, it really only matters if, Baker or whoever the quarterback is and Lincoln are on the same page. The yeah. receiver's running the route well, regardless. And when it, a lot of the stuff, when it comes to third downs, we have a third down check for every play. I, there's a lot of man zone beaters. Um, you know, lots of, you'll see lots of people do it where it's third and medium, third and long. You send a guy in motion. Why are they doing that? See if it's man or zone, right? Mm. right. See how are they rocking the safeties? You know, what are our checks? Stuff like that. So a lot of it, they know what they're supposed to check to. But mm. there's sometimes Lincoln might just you know, look out there and like something and try to change it to that. And it doesn't, and the receiver doesn't need to know because he's supposed no, to the just do his knows. job. So the signals are easy. They're subtle. So like there was only, we only had a couple signals for like inside run. So if like, if he looks over and he gives you this, it's inside run. You know, if it's two away from you, your rules. What would you tell me that again? Just this right here. A little fist, little fist. Okay. Yeah, basically just a fist to the side. So that, that told the receivers, if it's inside run, and they know if they're to the call or away from the call, what their rules are. Are they blocking for the run or are they blocking for the quarterback pull? Um, or, I mean, if he, if we're in, you know, trips, you got trips to the right, we're running a, you know, a run play and he looks over the X, he likes, it's a man, you might call a slant. Mm -hmm. He just looks over, does that. It turns into an RPO because we're so, it's still going to be a run call, but he's going to throw the ball pretty quick. So is that a, a difference maker as a um, one talent a receiver or running back would have? the ability to pick up on that and change on the fly. I mean, you could have a guy who's super fast and maybe has good hands, but if he can't pick up on that, he can't dynamically change in the game. Does that yeah. ever come up and you say, you're not going to be my starter until you can figure that out? I mean, I think you see that more with younger guys. Okay. Um, I think it's kind of expected. Um, I think a lot of people don't understand the transition and how much different it is from high school to college. That's why the same college in the NFL. I mean, how many first-round draft picks don't make it to a second contract, you know? Um, it's, it's hard. And that's why, you know, a lot of these kids don't play early. Or some of them, they never make it. It's hard. It's, I mean, you know, it's shocking a guy like Giddy Westbrook, when yeah. he's a Blitnikoff, goes to the Jaguars, who didn't really have a whole lot of talent. You would think he would be, yeah. you know, big time right off the bat. But the thing and, is, and, every dude on that defense can run. Yeah. And they're all mm -hmm. damn good players, right? That's right. why yeah. they're in the NFL. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're up there running a 4-5, everybody runs a 4-5, except for <laughs> the D linemen, with the exception of a couple DNs, they might run 4-5s. Um, Who would have guessed that Blake Bell would still be in the NFL yeah. as a tight end two at this time point? Two-time Super Bowl champ. I mean, yeah. watching him come in as a highly touted quarterback from yeah. Kansas yeah. and then make that transition to tight end his last year at OU, and then he's still in the NFL. Well, and if he does that a couple years or, earlier, I mean, what, he go in the third round? Mm -hmm. I mean, he might be a first, second round pick. He's got the right. size, yeah. for sure. Yeah. And the brains. Yeah. He, well, let's get to some listener questions. Okay. Let's see. What do we got here? I had them all loaded up, but we got on to other topics. Classic Jay. That is classic Jay. But we're all good enough in our <laughs> jobs here, too. and TikTok. And... Okay. Oh, so so, so some, of these, some of these are not specific. They're all going to be different questions. 
Uh, I would expect every question to be different. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe some people put in multiple of the same questions. You don't know. Okay, let's see. It's going well. <laughs> Matt wants to know, how often do coaches have to stay relevant with recruits? And or how often are there um, requests from recruits to get their commitment or things that the parents want and different things? I would say it's quite frequent. Yeah. Um, I think I think you got to look at, like, think of recruiting like any type of sales or business. Um, you know, you got to stay on top of it. So, if, you know, if I want this kid to commit or if I want this deal, you got to keep, you know, you got to keep talking. You got to keep communication open. You got to keep talking to them. Um, kids go cold. They don't answer your calls, text sometimes, but you got to keep at it, right? Um, you know, the commitment deal is weird because there's also, when you're a school like Oklahoma or these, you know, top schools, a lot of kids want to go there, right? Um, you know, let's say receivers, O-line, you're only taking two or three a class for the most part, right? But there might be six of the top 25 receivers who want to come. So there's some strategery there too. Um, sometimes you don't take kids' commitments. I mean, that's kind of the reality of it. Um, yeah, so when, we, so when the public sees that we put an offer out to a kid, so there are, there is such a thing as a committable offer yes. and just offers. So the written offers don't go out until September 1st of their senior year, I think is the date. Um, but there's still times, I know, I don't, I don't know the exact rule. I don't, I want to say you can't rescind a written offer, but there's kind of the whole, like, there's no reason for you to come here. We're not going to honor it. I so you I, could take, I, in theory, a, I, a kid you don't want yes. per se, he has the ability well, to also, come regardless. But I, if I he's don't, had a, a, no, a I don't think so offer. because there's only so many spots. He won't get a scholarship. Yeah, he won't get a scholarship. Yeah, a scholarship. Okay. Um, so, like, that's why quarterbacks, I mean, quarterbacks commit junior year, right? Typically early junior mm -hmm. year, sophomore going to junior year for the most part. Yeah. Why? Because there's typically one score, quarterback spot per signing class. So, if I, want, if I got an offer from OU and I'm serious about being a QB at OU, I better take it now because if I don't, there's another kid down the street who's probably going to take it, right? Um you know, requests from parents and stuff. I didn't deal with a lot of that. You know, people make promises. Um, I don't, you know, like numbers, stuff like that. Um, everybody has their own kind of. Is it everywhere from like, um, you know, can you guarantee that my kid's going to start as a freshman? See, I. Or just play I know time. the way my dad does it. And my dad's most realest person you're going to get in recruiting. Um, I mean, he's. And I might add the best recruiter at OU. I mean, he, for what he I did mean, in the yeah. in the two thousands with the running backs. Oh, it's unmatched. He's yeah. told unmatched. kids like, I mean, my job is to get a, somebody to replace you next year. That's, I mean, that's your recruiting job, right? My job is to go out and find somebody better than you every class. Um, I mean, I've, I, if you talk to some of the guys from the two thousands, guys who turned out to be all Americans and first round picks, I mean, tell guys you'll never play here, stuff like that. <laughs> um, but you know, it's. I don't know a lot of the promise stuff. I, I was never a part of those conversations. That would have been more of like a, a kid and his family with Lincoln or something. Um, a little I, more intimate conversation. Yeah, it's more of an intimate yeah. conversation. Um, I think you got to be careful getting in the, engaging in a lot of stuff like that because once you start, where you stop. Um, yeah, you can't backtrack those conversations. And, you know, I've especially the number thing, and I've heard it just through, you know, some of my friends still in the profession have people promising numbers of two or three kids. Well, which one do you give it to? Yeah. Um, you know, I got my fourth year senior who's become a starter who wa he wants number eight, but I promised, you know, the number two linebacker in this class that he has number eight, you know, how wow. do you manage that? Um, <laughs> Isn't that crazy? And it seems stuff petty to us. As that, yeah. But yeah. Like, oh, I, I want to have 44. But, but that's, whatever, a, that's but... a world changer to some of those kids. Yeah. I'm number eight. I've always been yeah. number eight. That's, that's all I know. Yeah. So didn't ba Baker had to give that up himself, right? In, in Tampa. Doesn't he have to give up his he's, number? He's is he not six? six? Oh, wait. I don't know. He's six at Tampa. He, he, he was not six at, oh, at, uh, at the LA. Rams. At the Rams, yeah. At the Rams. Yeah. But the yeah. Rams yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was what? Like, number? Like, it was something weird. Some, 15? Yeah, or something. something yeah. odd. Which, it's an odd number. I mean, granted, he wasn't the guy there. He came in right. to be a back yeah. quarterback. Yeah. Well, I could see how it would be important for him, not just the 
um, sentimental value or whatever. It's, it's your but identity. It's your brand. Yeah, it's brand. Your identity. yeah. I mean, people yeah. call him Six. Like yeah. I, I remember Orlando all the time. Be like, hey, Six, or let's go Six. You know, yeah. stuff yeah. like that. That's yeah. that's your name, your identity. It's your number. It's kind of who you are. That's How good. cool was it when they brought Baker's jersey out? <laughs> Like the suspension? Like what? he died. Like he died. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I thought it was stupid. Yeah. Uh, I, Baker even thought it was good. I, mean, I remember sitting over there like, what the fuck? I, know, yeah. <laughs> like, I thought Orlando Brown was about to like get on his knees and pray. And I no, thought so it that was, was awesome. That was after the was it a Kansas game, is that what it was? Yeah. The Who's your daddy? Yeah, yeah. It was Which, a Kansas I was at the Kansas game, yeah. and I didn't know anything about it because I had started on the – I was on the Kansas sideline side for the first half. And there were so few people And then you there. just got to sit wherever but you wanted. I walked, yeah, so I walked <laughs> yeah. around, and then I was behind the OU bench. And then I'm, my text is blowing up like, Baker just grabbed his crotch and was yelling at Kansas. I was like, yeah. okay, so what? And awesome. then you're like, whoever the announcer was like, oh, that's so Bush League or whatever. Yeah. Who was it? Uh, it, was the, it was the Alabama dude, wasn't it? Was it McElroy? McElroy, 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 McElroy yeah. And he's like, yeah. I can't yes. believe And I'm like. That doesn't entail. The, that's not the Heisman way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, then you come to find out that they didn't shake his hand. At the, they didn't shake his hand. Yeah. They're talking shit the whole time. Yeah, you cares? know, hitting him late. Yeah, and then so Kyler started that game and had like a 60-yard Yeah, I broke like a 60-yard, like the third <laughs> yeah. play, I think, second yeah. or third play. Yeah. All right, here's another question from one of our listeners, Josh. He wants to know. What's the biggest difference between a Stoops ran team and a Riley ran team? It's really not a lot of difference. Mm-hmm. Um, I wasn't, I didn't work for Bob full time, but just you know, like growing up and being a part of the program as a student, I didn't really see much of difference. Um, I think Lincoln might have been more hands on, um, and I think in a specific area or holistically. Holistically, mm-hmm. um, and I think. So did Bob like let his coordinators do what yeah, they were going to do? Yeah, so, I mean, Bob was more involved with the defense. Um, you know, he'd come in, in the de- offense room and hang out sometimes, but he wasn't really in there. He let his offense coordinators run their show, which he always had great offense coordinators, and he was able to. Yeah. Um, I didn't really see much. I think we might have done more, just more involved, more stuff with Lincoln. Um, I think outside looking in, sorry not to cut you off, but uh, something that we've said on this pod specifically, um, fan perspective, I'm sure you've seen it, but something that I've said even is a vibe of um, maybe less discipline and or accountability on the Lincoln staff with the players. And 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 it's, maybe it's more off the field type of stuff. Yeah, I mean, and I, there's again fan perspective. Yeah, it could just be no. an age thing too. Like Bob's old school, Lincoln's yeah. more new school, yeah. and I mean that that changes your perception yeah, of, of sure. how um, life is essentially. Yeah, yeah I yes and no. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's things I'm not going to be specific. No, 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 sorry, specific about any of this. I mean, there's some stuff I didn't like about how we did or didn't do things. Um, That's what they with accountability and with, discipline, right? yeah. um, but not my program yeah, yeah. so yep. i know one thing you know like my uncle always said is you got to be careful of making a lot of rules because um, yeah. when you make a lot of rules once you make an exception you kind of you have to start making more exceptions you know well, that's the thing when you're not when you're not alabama and you're not georgia yeah you can't have those rules well and th- that sh- rigid structure you and know? you know bob had the luxury bob won a national championship a second year right so Bob could have never went, played a national championship the rest of his career, but it still would have been Bob, right? You know, I think Lincoln had a huge pressure to be that guy. You know, all the – besides the 90s, you know, the dark days, everybody else won national championships, right? Bob won national championship, played in, what, three more after that, I mm-hmm. think? Um, and one playoff, yep. I think um, Lincoln had a lot of pressure. You know, it was his first head job. He didn't, you know, most guys, you go, OC, you know, <laughs> yeah. you're a mid-major OC, you go to big time OC, you go down to a, you know, a group of five head coach or a small power five head coach, then you move up, right? Well, he went from ECU OC, OU OC to being the head coach of the top five program in college football. Mm-hmm. Um, but so did Bob. So did Bob, yeah. And uh, No, it was a major program that yes. he left. He went from Florida. But only one He won a national championship. Yeah. Right, well, no, but I'm saying that he, you know, he came in with the pressure too, but he had yeah, to win. Yeah, he, and, but he came and, in, he came in with a different kind of pressure because that was coming off of right the one Schnellenberger year, the three right. Blake years. Yeah, so just, the program's just some down. Bad for sure. Time. The expectations taken, were really low. Over a Corvette and not a Pinto. Yeah, absolutely. Now Switzer came in very much like Lincoln, um, almost identical. 
he, inherited he, a good team. He came from a stronger program. He came from a stronger group. In fact, that group that came in was just a legendary group that he was with. And he eventually gets the, the job as a very young head yeah. coach and, and obviously immediately wins and, and actually doesn't lose, period. Yeah. Uh, different until times. A, a fluke. So very different situation. But, yeah, Lincoln, Lincoln came into a lot of pressure. Yeah. Well, I think he sets himself up for more pressure throughout his la his later years at OU after that for post the yeah. first year because he makes it to a playoff. The first year, you probably should have won a national championship. We probably should have won a national championship, yeah. right? Yeah. And then, yeah. you know, the next year we have the best offense in college football again, but can't stop anybody. We can't stop anybody. You know, I I always joke about you know we talk you know championship November. We had what did we we beat Kansas like fifty five forty five. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. We should have lost to OSU, game. but they skipped the ball to Tylon. Yep. Corn Dog did. Yeah. We go up to West Virginia, and if they don't put Trey Brown in the stands, we're going down 14, and we're going to lose that game. That like like late blocking or – No, they, they blocked him into the stands. Yeah, <laughs> into the stands, literally. So the yeah. next play, Buzzy gets a strip scene, sack, so. ties the game up, because um, they, they took it down. They were going up 14. Um, yeah, I mean, it, I think it got really hard for him because we were there, right? We were – one play away from playing the national championship, and I think we win that game. Um, 18, you know, we we came back against Bama. We, I mean, we scored some points in the second yeah. half. We just too, we didn't. Was, this, was, a slow, was a slow start <laughs> shell-shocking a little bit? It was. I mean, because we had a damn good team. We had a really good O-line, too. I mean, that O-line's uh, – 18, in my opinion, 18 O-line's better than the 17 O-line. Oh, yeah. You have five NFL players on that line, right? Yeah. Um, well, we won the Joe Moore Award in 18, right? Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, um, you know, but we go out. We what did we go out? Twenty eight nothing or twenty one? Twenty one nothing. 21. In the first quarter. No, it's, I, I think, think it was twenty eight. Twenty eight at nothing. least. I, I, th was it? It? I thought it, was, it might have been twenty eight. I think it was twenty. In the first, I think yeah. they they get it like a sack or two each of the first Holly couple possessions. Holly was injured and helping. Yeah, that's true. Um, it was shell shocking. I mean, we rallied back and scored some points. It was just too late, and we couldn't get any stops. So right. let's Good kind question. of ask about some defense. You're on the offensive side of the ball. How, what's the what's the vibe in the room when 17, 18, 19, you have the best offense in the country pretty much all three of those years? Well, 19, I guess LSU is better. But 17, 18, 19, you've got incredible offenses, and the defense can't do anything. Is there any animosity, or? animosity in the Maybe locker room some. of I, the offensive guys being like, I, I if don't you guys can just stop somebody, room, we'll win this game? I would say those guys, they knew it. Um, they knew you know, what they had to do. Yeah. What about I, coaches? Was there any, not finger pointing necessarily, but I think, was there any like, if I you think, guys could just stop these sons of bitches for two drives, we've, we're going to win a national championship. I think we, as an offense, knew what we had to do every week. Yeah. Um, score I think it's kind of one of those. <laughs> so the, pre the pressure really was we need to score on every yeah. drive. I think it was one of those, like, we, we know we got to score. Um, you know, we might get a turnover on defense or a stop or two, but. If we take care of business on our end, it's not going to matter. Um, well, I want to pull on that thread a little bit then because you mentioned how Lincoln is very hands-on. Did he not take enough responsibility for getting his defense, his system as a defense, where it needed to be? What was he, the disconnect? I mean, he spent a ton of time over there. Um, you know, like Grinch, when I, from what I'm around with Grinch, Grinch is awesome as a coach. He's a motivator. He pushes those guys. I think kids believe in him. You just, they never got the results from it. Um, and, you know. That, and not that, that, even last year, though, like, that, that's, that's thematic, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you have arguably the best defensive motivator in college football as your head coach. Yeah. And he's spending all his, I'm not say all, because I don't know, I'm not in the practice, but assuming most of his time on that side of the ball in practice. Yeah. And given it's a different system, it's a different scheme, you have guys who are learning new stuff, but even that, they're athletes, right? They're Division One athletes at the University of Oklahoma who performed under what I believe their abilities should perform, right? And yeah, I think that's I, I probably a common that. theme yeah. with Grinch. I mean, we felt the same way about Grinch when he came in. I was, you go listen to one of Grinch's first few press conferences or any of his press conferences even maybe, Yeah. I mean, I want to go play for the guy. Yeah. Like, I know he talks talks a lot, but the dude knows what he's talking about. Yeah, you know, it's weird. I I mean, the guy is, I mean, world-class motivator, and I, I, I think those guys buy into it. It's just they don't, 
You know, even if you watch USC this year, um, what were they like? Same story in the back half. five in sacks and turnovers yeah. or something, I think. <laughs> yeah, um, and then they just still give up a ton of points. They don't tackle in space. Um, I mean, if you watch the bowl game, I mean. It says it all. How do you score that many points and lose a game? Yeah, the two lane. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, you know. <laughs> Same way you score that many points and almost lose the game. <laughs> yeah. I always felt like there was kind of a divide um, between the offense and defense. And I don't know if it's anything anybody said, but I just kind of always had this feeling. Just like there are two because, teams on one team? Just because, yeah, just because of the results and how the teams turned out to be. You know, 17, we had a lot of good players on defense. We did some good things on defense. I mean, you got NFL players. You got we, Kenneth did we, Murray's of the world. Did we have a national championship defense? No. Um, Weren't we one of the only – I think we were the only uh, playoff team with not, like, a top-10 defense. I think we were in, like, the 20s or 30s maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, 18 and 19 is just kind of like offense versus the world, you know. Um, Truly. And – This isn't a fan question, but um, nerds like us, we like to follow recruiting. And on paper, there's – Almost every defensive player across the board on OU for the last seven years. Four-star offers it, everywhere. Yes, is, yeah. is wanted by all these other teams that field considerably better defenses. Yeah. How does that, in, in a layman's term, how does that happen? Like, how, how does... How does, how does um, it not work out? <laughs> how does it not work out when the talent is there? Is, is it, Seems is it schematics? Seems is it how it gels? I mean, you miss on guys. Like, the three receivers that came in that were all... Top five, you know, Trajan and, and yeah, but Hazel these other, and Theo. These other yeah, teams Theo. have we, to miss on we guys. We couldn't have been any more excited about that receiving class. We should have got Garrett Wilson. We were so excited about that receiving class. That, yeah. Like, this is going to be incredible. Um, Trajan got in trouble, obviously. Well, but the I other two but like for, never. But like player for player, you, you could almost go down the list with, I mean, I always say it's maybe not fair because their, their scheme is so yeah. different. But, um any other team that in the Big 12, just the Big 12, that ranks considerably better than OU. And you're like, well, I'm not going to trade. I'm going to like it backer for theirs. Yeah. I'm not going to trade our safety for theirs. I'm not going to trade our corner for Like, you could go across the board. You probably have nine guys. You're like, well, I'm not trading my nine for their nine. Yeah. And then they're 60 spots higher in team defense. I think, I mean, there's a lot of factors, whether it's, you know, bus, miss, you know, schematics, coaching. To me, it's just like there's the perfect gel of all those things together, and it just kind of it all happened. It happened, you know. Unfortunately, it it played out that way. Um, you know, you have a couple kids on that defense who are you know great players, and some kids that should be great players, but they're not. And you see kids that weren't necessarily quote unquote great at OU who are being successful professional. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, it it is it's just it's a conundrum. To, it's um, <laughs> to, to say the least. Yeah, I I think a lot of it could just be you know kids not developing um i mean think at oh you you're not take every kid you recruit was either the best or a top two kid on their high school right you know they're all four stars couple five you know mix of three stars right they all have a bunch of offers they're all damn good players in high school um it's just sometimes it just doesn't work out i think unfortunately for us there's a lot more of it not working out um why does it seem to be that happens more defensively than offensively we're in a tough. Because I mean, you had the best offensive coordinator in the country. On yeah, the other side I mean, of the if you look at yeah, and the best quarterbacks. And you the look best at your, your, you know, the the players you're bringing in. I mean, we've missed on guys. We've missed on quarterbacks with Lincoln. Um, you know, we've missed on missed backs, on receivers, receivers, O line. I, mean, I know, but you, other players, even if they're lesser, have stepped in, right? And yeah, and become I players. just. But but like defensively, it seems like if you miss. On some defensive guys, you're just like, oh man, we're, I th we're I in think some serious trouble. Defense right. is a, is a, you know, defense you get exposed more one on one. Yeah. Um, you know, receiver you may drop a ball. You know, O line you may get beat, but you know that's not the play that gets circled. If it's a four man, day, right? four man rush, you know, the center might help out the guard, or the back might be there. You know, unless unless the tackle is just getting ran around every single play, most people don't see that, right? Um, but defense, everybody knows when you miss a tackle. Everybody knows when you blow a coverage. You know, if somebody runs behind you, you give a touchdown, everybody's looking at you. When you get ran over, everybody knows who that was. Um, I think defense, there's more of a spotlight on you as an individual. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I don't 
I don't really know. I think it's just a lot of unfortunate things, you know, adding up, and it, that's what it was. Um, yeah. What other questions from the listeners? Um, we had another question, uh, and this maybe just cover <coughs> this in all of its spectrum. Um, do we do we win if we don't squib kick <laughs> against Georgia? And and what happened with the squib? What was what was said about it? Was it planned? Was it? Oh my God! What just happened? <laughs> um, Reflecting on it, was it a huge deal? Did, do do the need, coaches? Do we is it need just to a fan thing? essentially? Do we need to decide <laughs> if we go find Austin Cyber? <laughs> <laughs> so, the squib thing was weird. So, everybody in the box was gone. You know, we just scored. Going down so the they left. They they they, they, down. they yeah. on the elevators. Okay. Okay. They went to the elevators and they got to get on some tr- or some you know whatever golf carts and get their ass to the locker room. Some of those places it's kind of a hall. So, um, you know, after we scored, you know, my dad's like, "Hey, you good with us coming down?" I'm like, yeah. So the conversation was entirely between Lincoln and Coach Bowl where to do the squib kick. Um, so it was a coaching decision. It was a coaching decision. Okay. Um, now the execution probably wasn't. So it was, Austin, I think it was supposed it, to be a deep squib. It turned into an execution. I mean, he just missed hit it. I yeah. mean, that guy couldn't have gotten a better bounce. And then what? They throw a ball for thirty yards, kick a field goal. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know if it was necessarily a deep versus not deep. I think he just hit it. Just, it, where it just it got the way it bounced. Yeah. yeah, I Went mean, right that's the it. thing about squib kicking is you never know. It's just but that's, like an not up to the, that's not up to the kicker ever. No, I okay. mean, it was his onside kick. He just missed hit it, and they got a good bounce. Um, you know, I don't – What is it – how, how – I, how I do don't you think, think – How do you think the second half – did it did it change any game plan? Did it change any um, – Comfort level. I think it might have, it might have toned us down a little. You know, we were riding pretty high going in that half. You know, we we're playing fucking great, right? Mm-hmm. We were up seventeen, I think. Yeah, 31 14. 14 yeah. Okay, scoring every time. So seven, seventeen ball, points. Yeah, seventeen. Um, were we up thirty? We went up thirty-eight to thirty-eight to two. I think when we scored, we scored two touchdowns. I think in the we went half. thirty-eight seventeen in the third quarter. Okay, so they I were at fourteen, kicked it to go seventeen. They, they kicked it to go 17 into half. Yeah, into so, half. Yeah. And they it, were only down You know, 14. I think it it might have toned us down a little, but it gave them hope. I mean, that place, they went fucking wild after they kicked that. It was like a 53 or – it was a pretty long field goal. It was goal. a boot. Yeah. Yeah. It was a long field goal. Of course, it was the longest ever. I'm pretty sure it was. Probably. Right. They made, it, they made defensive it adjustments it's in the second always. half, too. They, and they did. And, I mean, that's an NFL defense. I mean, you got Roquan Smith running side to side. You know, that guy um, – What? So, you say tone uh, – like – it toned just, us down. That that makes sense. And like a like a morale standpoint, uh-huh. like you know, like when everything is going great, just you know, scored, and you just get punched in the gut, and it's like, damn. So like, so it's it not was as, it was a substantial event. I think so. Okay. Um, I don't know if it necessarily changed the outcome of the game, but it kind of you know took a hit on us, and it gave them so much momentum. You know, they just had a terrible half. Um, they're down what. 20 at that point? Is that right? No, no, you're, no yeah. sorry. I, I meant they went, they, thir- they went up. We went up. I'm pretty sure we quarter. went up 38 17 in the third. It was 31 to 17 at half. Yeah. So, so then 31 we 14. The so we're up three possessions. Yeah. And, and they then the field goal they and then I don't think goal. we went back up on them like that in the third. I'm pretty sure. I think they, look, they, I think they came storming. Right. While you're looking that up, I, I think they came storming right back. Ask about that because you, as you say, it changed the tone of what we were doing. And you made it an interesting comment there. It made me think about the adjustment factor, and they made great adjustments. Yeah. Um, was that mo- maybe even a more significant coaching mistake by Lincoln to not make adjustments for adjustments in the second half versus what the squib kick did? Because the squib kick is just three points, yeah. and it's just it's a little momentum and hope, but you should be able to overcome that. It's the all the adjustments they yeah. made. You know, I don't. That's so long. I don't remember the adjustments we made at half in that game. I mean, um, everything we did was working. It, yeah, so it just seems it's like hard to, we like, might have changed your game plan. We might have came half. out and kept doing what we were doing, and then. Well, that's where I think you got to change in the third quarter. Or they something. made the adjustments, and we working. finally caught on, and maybe we didn't make the right ones after that, or they just 
I well, think that's one thing let we've... us down too because they just let the running backs. Yeah, was, but they also got the scoop. And, they also got the scoop and score. Yeah. Who was their two yeah. running backs? Yeah, so it was Swift and somebody else. It was thirty-one seventeen, and then okay. they they immediately came out in the third quarter, scored, scored a touchdown. I mean, okay. Swift and right. Chubb just ran wild to make it a one possession that's game. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It should have been a three so possession game. So you're talking game, they, they made a three possession game down to a one. You know, that's that's a big you know morale change and momentum of the game. You know, football. And like every other sport, it's momentum, and yeah. that's they really. I mean, they went on a they, they went kinda, on a twenty four point yeah. twenty four to zero run. I think they kind of they stole some momentum there. You know, we had everything going for us, nothing for them. They kind of stole some of that, and it's. I don't know if you could say the game changes. We win or lose, rego- like maybe we don't, maybe we do. Um, I, don't, I remember standing right there behind that booth, literally that spot, <laughs> when they kicked that field goal and saying. That after yeah. that after that squib kick and after the field goal, that just lost us the Rose Bowl. It's just it's a difference of us, you know. You're running in at half, and our half of the stadium's going fucking wild because we're kicking Georgia's ass. Compared to, they have a lot. They have the new life, you know. Like, they're, oh, they're, that's a bad they're, taste. They're, they're being pretty yeah. loud going in the half. And you know, he was able to use that as a motivating factor in the in the oh, halftime yeah, of to say, now we need to make our adjustments. We got a chance. Well, in and this you game. go in there and you tell your your offense, we get the ball. We mm-hmm. go score. It's one possession game. And so sure it's, enough, they it's did. Almost, and they did. If we right. score, it's basically zero zero again. You know, it's one possession game. You get a stop. We score again. Zero zero. Yep. That's maybe that's a good listener question. Good good question there. Yeah. Any um, other good questions to, to um, round us off? A very special listener, Mr. Cooper. He wants to know. <laughs> some of the major differences between the quarterbacks, just like the ball coming off their hand, who throws the prettiest ball, who throws the most catchable ball. Can you tell when you're watching a kid get recruited mm. or in different camps and just like it, it just comes off their hand differently? Yeah. No, I I, I think you, you can for sure. I think it's the same of somebody pitching or, you know, somebody hitting a baseball. You know, you see a guy hit a ball and you're like, wow, that ball comes off the bat different. Um, I think if you just pay attention to, you know, throwing mechanics maybe, um, you know, kids, you can tell somebody uses their all arm. Um, You can tell kids who they're in sync with their throwing motion. You know, the hip should follow the arm, right? Um, You know, I think Baker probably, Baker might have had the strongest arm. I think Kyle, stronger than Kyler. I think so. I think Kyler probably threw the best ball, in my yep. opinion. Um, Better than Rattler. See, I I wasn't around Rattler enough. Okay. I don't really, you know, Rattler threw was pretty good. Um, and you're saying just the I mean just the ball. the ball, yeah, just, just the, the ball. Yeah. I I think Kyle. They all. Th- I mean, they're all obviously great great throwers. I would probably say probably Kyler's probably got the best ball. Um, I'd say Kyler Baker, Jalen. Yep, I think that's um, probably where I'd put it as well. If I mm-hmm. from a none very of them, outsider. in my mm-hmm. opinion, I saw any like flaws in their mechanics or anything. Um, Kyler is just such a gifted and natural athlete, you know. I mean, Kyler Murray is arguably the best athlete on every field he's ever stepped on in any sport in his entire life, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, I mean, can, he's like Bo Jackson. I yeah. Mean, he, yeah. He can I do it all. I feel his pain. Yeah. <laughs> um, given he was never on a field with Jay. <laughs> right. That is technically true. <laughs> yeah, I had, that is true. I had a question we talked about a little bit on the walkover about um, with your lineage between your whole family football-wise that you didn't pursue coaching as a as a career. Yeah. And we talked a little bit about just, you know, moving all around and all that stuff. Not, not everybody can be as, as lucky as your dad was and even Mike being at Oklahoma State as long as he has because – you know, you're talking about your friends, three high schools or three, you know, three high schools in three years and all that stuff. Yeah. And you just decided not just to step away from it. Yeah. Um, you know, after my first year full time, I took some time to reflect. Um, you know, you I've spent my whole life around it, even as a student, but it's different until you actually do it. Um, you know, basically from when we start in July until the day after the game, the bowl game, it's all day, every day. It's, um, you know, it's waking up every morning, going to work and going home, going to sleep. Um, you know, like my first year we talked about earlier, like I'd still go out. Um, <laughs> it would have been my fifth year in college. So I'd, you know, I'd make time to go out on Thursdays and the weekends, but then you're sacrificing the sleep you need. So then you're going off at three hours of sleep. But I mean, long, t- I think long term, um, I just kind of asked myself what I wanted. Um, 
and projecting, you know, I have a wife and kids one day. Um, and I'm not saying like, I didn't have a bad life as a child. I mean, I had an incredible childhood. Um, you know, a lot of experiences and opportunities nobody else has had. Um, and I, you know, I appreciate everything my parents did for me and, you know, the sacrifices my dad made with his job, but I didn't want, um, I didn't want to, you know, go down that road and follow the paths of that a lot of other, co most coaches go through. Yep. Um, you know, we kind of talked about earlier that kind of, it's the closest thing to probably being in the military, you know, you're at a new school every year, year to two years, and that's the reality of it. Um, you know, most programs, unless you're a top program, you get, there's a reality is you're probably going to get fired within three years, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I, I wouldn't mind moving a couple times. Um, you know, I'm still kind of in my early in my new career. I wouldn't mind moving at some point, but I, I didn't, I didn't want for me in my future. Um, and, you know, projecting a family one day for them to have to go through what would probably be my career. That's good. Yeah, that's that's good. good. I got, I got one last one last. So, uh, as we wrap up, um, and thanks for having, thanks for coming. Yeah. yeah man, you've been, this has been awesome. amazing insight. Amazing I'll have to insight. come back during season, uh, 2023 prediction for the Sooners. Um, can somebody pull up the schedule? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's, it's well, a bunch I mean, of wins. It's, it's 12 <laughs> games. And 11 <laughs> regular season. Yeah, I, I don't I, have to look at it. Yeah. So I actually <laughs> listened, I listened to my dad talk about it on the radio on Monday. It's the first time I've listened to him. Oh, I think that's cool, by the way. He's doing uh, Sports Center. Yeah, he's the doing Gundy Monday. Gundy or, Monday. And he's doing um, it at Louis across so, town. So, yeah, I remember looking at these schedules a couple months ago. OU and OSU got really good draws on these schedules. Either of them play any Texas teams except for TCU. I mean, OSU only plays TCU. OU only has Texas and TCU. Obviously, the best two teams, but that's leaving out Baylor and Tech, two teams yeah. they lost. And we skipped Kansas, Kansas State. State. And they lose and Kansas State. Yeah. So yeah. You, lose, you don't play three teams you lost to last year, right? And we don't go to Waco. Yeah. I mean, your first four games, I think, are cakewalks. So, Iowa State, you never know. I, I think they should probably be undefeated going into Texas. Uh, at worst, four and one. Maybe you lose Iowa State. I don't. I don't think they should. You know, Iowa State lost a lot. Um, they yeah. kind of finally lost all those fourth and fifth year guys. Um, UCF. Yeah, I mean they should beat UCF. They should beat Kansas. Um, I mean I'd pick them over OSU right now. I think. I think you're going ten and two. I think best case ten and two. I I think. At this point, I think nine and three would be realistic. Um, so eight and four disappointment. Nine and nine three, and three and ten and two would be a good season, I think. Um, I would, in my opinion, they'll pro I think they'll lose to Texas. Um, I think TCU's up in the air, but I think it's a short week. It Coming is it's back a from BYU. It's a too, Saturday. Right? Yeah, we get the Black Friday. You'll get a. You'll yeah. probably get a night game out there, so you're gonna get lose an hour, get back, and mm -hmm. then you play a Friday. Um, so I think, I think Texas and TCU should be the only losses, which they could beat TCU, they could beat Texas. Um, but those are the challenges. Those will be your biggest challenges. Um, and that's about just performing what you should. I think where you should perform. And this is kind of how we've been forever. They're gonna. They're gonna slip up somewhere. Yeah, that's just kind of what we've done every year. You know? them, like, I mean, yeah. most, whether it's honestly, most teams across the country everybody slip does. up. Yeah, everybody yeah. slips up. Other, everybody. Than, um, other than the Georgia, uh, even the they have their yeah. moments of doing that. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, Georgia should have lost to Ohio State in that game too. Should have maybe lost to Missouri early yeah, in the season. That's right. So, um, that's right. and the slip up, I don't know who would be. And mighty Kent State game of run. That's right. I would <laughs> say maybe OSU. OSU on a you heater. Don't, you don't think Kansas excited. is quite Kansas there yet? Kansas is scary. I, I Kansas, Kansas, scary. Quarterback Kansas looks... has some good stuff going yeah. for him, and it's on the road. Um, Iowa State's always a wild card. you got to respect Iowa State. It's it's weird looking at the schedule and not seeing Tech or Baylor. Yeah. It's, just, it's different. It's odd. Um, I think K-State's the biggest miss for, like, the, oh, the no, most helpful yeah. miss for I, us. I agree. Is we would have been at K State, K State this year. Yeah, I yeah, think that's I our mean, most you get Iowa miss. State at home. Well, at Waco would have been tough too. Your tough road games, besides the Cotton Bowl, are going to be back to back at Kansas at OSU. Which, I mean, both of those teams could be good. They could be terrible. Mm -hmm. I mean, you never know. I mean, I would have OSU probably winning seven, maybe eight. I think what did they fit? What's their win loss like six and a half? 
Yeah, and I don't I think, think Mike's ever been under seven. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I, I don't think six is fair. He always I, outperforms the line. I, I would give OSU between seven and eight. But I think OU has no. They have no reason not to win nine. I think they should get up to ten. That's a good assessment. Well, Casey, thank you for joining yeah, us. Man. This has been Definitely. very thank insightful. You so much. Yes. Very, very good. And we're going to hold you to that. We're going to bring you back during oh, the season. Yeah, we'll do it. We'll Absolutely. get some uh, post game or some midweek uh, evaluation of where we are. Yeah, well, let's do it. Until next time, Boomer. Sooner. Sooner.